Hello, my friend. Hey, how are you, Farron? Hi, uh, Pat. Hello, my friends, and good afternoon to everyone. Welcome to this week's Art Conversation. We are glad to have this opportunity to stay connected during this pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, during this time when we may not be able to physically touch and hold each other's hand, uh, we are glad that we could find a way to be able to touch each other's hand, um, hand and art, sorry, not hand, art, uh, um, touch each other's heart through our art and media. Thank you for this day. For um, in all this, we grow closer to each other. And thank you for taking the time to be with us today. I'm Farin Chalkowski, and I'm pleased to introduce this week um, artist, uh, Pat Zolasko. We are so excited to, uh, to be with you, Pat. How are you doing? How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, where are you joining us from? I'm, I'm in Florida. Oh, um, I'm in the southern part of the state, which um, is about to have a storm. So. Okay. <laughs> it's hot here too, today, too, too. So I think we have the same weather. Uh, probably. <laughs> Okay, Pat, uh, would you um, tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, who you are, and how you became an artist? Um, I grew up in the Northeast. I grew up in a, in a multicultural city. Um, I grew up in a home that revered the art, uh, revered visual arts and performing arts. Uh, I was always getting taken to different museums, galleries, art fairs. Uh, and from a very early age, as a toddler, I was introduced to making art. Um, I would pursue uh, more of an ethnic art form known as making Ukrainian Easter eggs, Kesunke, the art of making those eggs. Um, so a lot of those icons and symbols have leached their way into what I make now. I was not encouraged to pursue a career in art. I was taught that art was very important because it enlarges your horizons. It enables you to think creatively, to engage in a meaningful conversation with others. And I was always taught that it was important for you to approach art and ask the question, why? What was it about it that was moving you and communicating to you? Um, I, I was allowed to make art, which of course I did. Um, my parents were always buying me supplies. And when I was old enough and I had time in my career, and, and by the way, I pursued a legal career. Um, but when I, whenever I had the time, I would audit classes. I would attend university classes. I continue to do that. Um, and I pursue residencies, which I find very meaningful. And I tend to gravitate towards residencies that also attract writers and poets. Mm -hmm. I believe in the cross-pollination that comes from that. Yeah, great, great. But uh, besides um, art, as your art, um, being artist, you have different profession too, right? I mean, yes. Yeah. So what what you doing? Uh, I was a lawyer. Oh, you okay? You were. So you retired now? I am retired. Um, happily so. Okay. <laughs> so now you have more time for art, right? <laughs> as much as I want. Okay. Yes. So uh, in our previous conversation we had before uh, this, um, beside, before today, you said you were about to close down your studio and say bye to art. So uh, what happened that you came back to art? About three years ago or so, I was very frustrated with what I was producing. Um, it was no longer acceptable to me. It wasn't challenging. Um, the art seemed rather mundane. And it didn't communicate what I was hoping it would do. I believe that art that we create should be a mirror and a reflection on our society and what, what we do. I want to create powerful art. Um, and I remember myself having that experience, walking into a gallery in the, um, the old Whitney Museum and coming upon an enormous mother well uh, that, was, that was hanging there and my knees buckled. And that's what I, I shoot to achieve in my work. Um, I'm confident I don't always achieve that, but I try for that. I strive for that. So I walked in there hoping to pack it all up, give it away, donate it to a school, burn the paintings in a pile and anything three-dimensional. Um, and right around then my daughter called. She was working half a world away 
a postcard arrived in the mail that day from her, along with a small care package containing some papers and other materials. And as we were chatting, I was looking at a substrate that was hanging on the wall and it became, I just said, I'm gonna burn it anyway. So I just started gluing on top of it. I started adhering some of these materials she had sent me and things that I had accumulated. And I forced a composition to work. I was creating a new, a new piece. And I realized as I looked up after I was done with the conversation that I had produced something that was more than acceptable. It, it was in my view, uh, stronger than it was. Uh, and that piece became over Sri Lanka. That started the ball rolling. Um, shortly thereafter- I have it here or not, but- um, Okay. Um, I don't have it here, like the over Sri Lanka. That's okay. Yeah. And then I, I just took it from there. I, I started to think about my relationship with my daughter and how meaningful that was. And I revisited old reading. I went back and I reread Anita Diamond's The Red Tent, um, another favorite author of mine, Muriel Barbary, um, The Elegance of the Hedgehog. And very quickly, I produced two more collages, um, again, using my own materials, uh, canvas uh, for the most part, and um, Rue de Brunel, which was string and, and papers that I had made or I had accumulated during the year. So Rue de Brunel and Measuring the Heart's Capacity followed very shortly after that. Um, and the following day, I think I read a, a highly charged political piece in the New York Times and it got me a little angry and I thought about it. And I kept thinking about a line in Dante's Inferno about how the hottest place in hell is reserved for those who remain neutral in the face of moral uh, crisis. And um, I also thought about the words of Dr. King about how only love can drive out hate. And even a line from Anna Karenina, all of these things started playing in my head. Um, um, Tolstoy said, every heart has its skeletons. So in other words, everybody has a deep secret or a dark side. And all of those things played and I created a very large uh, collage using string and papers and uh, paint, um, ink. Uh, and that was across the river Asheron. Which is this one, uh, we see it right today. Um, yeah, I mean, I have the title, uh, you made it in 2017. Okay, like, yes, uh, I'm not seeing it on my screen, but- Okay. <laughs> okay. But that's okay. And, um, I started another collage also on four panels, also equally large, it's uh, 96 inches tall. I started it at the Atlantic Center for the Arts in New Smyrna Beach, Florida, which is a, a beautiful compound. They run a, a great residency program. Um, and I was thinking about what we're doing to our environment. I live in, in, in a place where noticing climatic change is pretty obvious. Um, and when I had a time to reflect in that compound, I started this piece, but I, I seem to lack um, a verbal anchor for the piece. What's, um, Ped, what's the name of that piece? Do I have it here? Yes, you, it should be there from sea to shining oh, okay. sea. That's, okay, yeah, I have it here. From... And that piece I, I polished off only this past year. And what did it for me was listening to the testimony and reading the remarks of Greta Thunberg. Um, when she came to this country and made an impassioned plea as an environmental activist for our policymakers, our lawmakers to intervene and do something to save the environment. Um, so other literary references started happening after that. Yeah, so this is like, you know, you said there are four panel, right? Each one is um, 60 here, for example, from the from sea to shining sea, we see it here right now. Um, it said uh, 96 by 64 inches. Is this um, all your work? Um, like each canvas is uh, 96 by 64? Um, each one is 48 by 36. And I'm, I created those panels separately. And in order for me to see what the finished product looked like, because my studio is on the smaller side, I literally have to take them outside, haul them outside and put them together, leave them on the ground, climb a 10 foot ladder, the biggest ladder I own, and then look down. 
okay. and get a sense of what's working or not. So uh, again, it's the same, same premise. I was using string, rope, um, papers I had created, papers that I fabricated, um, whatever I could get my hands on. And I wanted the viewer to have the sense of something encroaching. Okay. Yes, wonderful, wonderful. So you said, um, so um, your inspiration, first of all, after you came back to art was your dar. And after the, that, you start reading, right? So when you try to create this connection uh, between uh, your reading and making art. Um, so uh, is this like, you know, reading um, are the only subject of your work, like, you know, what you read or the subject of your work, or you have different subject as well? It, it's the reading that prompts the work. Okay. Um, I will read a passage or two or an entire passage and certain words will stay with me and linger. And I will uh, write them down, jot them down. I record them. The reading can be a poem. It could be a novel, it could be the newspaper, it could even be lyrics. Okay. But there is something about the written word that prompts a visual image for me. And for me, the art becomes a visual language. It's communicating something different. It's, it's, it's as though that written word, I've processed it and I'm turning it out in a different way uh, that I hope is meaningful to other viewers. Um, uh, I'm sure, I'm sure they are very meaningful and a lot of symbols you use, as I can see. Um, I was reading an article by Ali Smith. Uh, the name of the article was a fence um, around our, um, around an amusement, amusement park, um, as well as by Frank Gardner, which is, by the way, Frank Gardner going to be one of our artists, uh, guests in two weeks, I believe. They say, they describe your work as puzzle. They said, uh, you creating your artwork by putting different pieces together, okay? So would you uh, please tell us why they call your work puzzle? What I think I'm doing, and, and apparently um, Fran, who authored the essay about the work that you're referring to, I'm, I'm taking materials that I already have where I might have created and I'm deconstructing them and I'm putting them together in a way that almost creates a new environment, a new place. Um, something that might seem at first, you have to sit there and really look at it and, and decide whether it's meaningful. Um, but that's my purpose. I'm, I'm creating a new environment. I'm creating space. I'm also creating line and mark by doing the same thing. Um, and I, I find that very satisfying. I'm, I'm making space, I'm clearing things away to create a new environment, a new space. Yes, wonderful. Would you uh, like, you know, um, also um, beside, beside um, reading one of, um, our, in our previous kind of conversation, actually you mentioned uh, one of your work by, um, you, you told me a story about one of your friend or client, which was architect. Oh. And um, you create an artwork based on a book he gives you. Yeah, uh, yeah. Which, which of these artwork uh, we see it here? Um, I don't know if you can see them through your screen. It's based on that uh, friendship um, you I, had. The, the piece would have been, there's one piece that you would have had there. It's um, remnants of a past life. Okay. During this process and fairly early on, um, there it is. Yes. Yeah. I, I received a book in the mail from an attorney I used to work with. And um, there was a time when I was um, this, this client was my, my, this woman was my client. I came to know her in her later years. We became dear friends before she passed away. And I received this book in the mail about this woman's father, who was a very famous architect in the United States and in Europe. And I didn't realize it, but my client had dictated and inscribed a note that was very personal to me in this copy of this book about her father, this art history book. And it was very tender, um, very meaningful to me. It was a reminder of my relationship with her. So I created a series of four small collages, remnants of, of a past life um, 
that you have up here is one of them. And um, it, to me, it, it seemed to be my response to her note to me. It was posthumous, um, but I was communicating with her after her passing. Yes, very great man. Wonderful, wonderful um, artwork and very meaningful, you know. Um, so um, what do you think about this situation? you know, about this social distance, about this pandemic and what you think an artist can do? Uh, well, what are you doing as an yeah. artist? I think making art is a very um, solitary practice um, where people who make art are accustomed to, to being in solitude. We, we don't have to venture outside. Um, periodically, I will paint with others, but for the most part, we're alone. It's for me personally, this is probably the most normal thing that I could be doing right now is creating art. Um, shortly, I'd say right around the time this pandemic came on everybody's radar screen, um, a pet of mine that I'd had for 12 years died. And I was very saddened by it. Um, she, she passed away and I started this other collage using this very durable but thin paper that I had found. I realized I could really abuse that paper. I could paint on it, I could print on it. Um, I could cut it up, I could rip it up. So I started a series of collages and that was the first in that sort of series. Again, to me, they're all part of this general series of work, which I, I loosely denominate as the Disappearing Line series. Um, but pieces like that came. Um, the, the other piece that I produced there um, was one based on a children's story. I, again, it occurred to me that in this process, in this pandemic, the one thing that's happening is we're staying in and we're not traveling as much Things are cooling down. The earth is, there. that's one of the pieces, beloved. Um, and the earth is being given a chance to regenerate. I'm seeing a lot of wildlife in my own area coming back, things that I haven't seen for years. Um, I'm hoping that the sea waters cool down sufficiently uh, also. So if there's any silver lining to this pandemic, it's that. The piece that you have up now, Farron, beloved, um, because I'm generally not, uh, I like socializing with my friends. A friend of mine sent me a note and it was a beautiful note. It was a reminder that even though we're apart, we really are still connected. We are all connected and we're never really truly alone. And she ended her note with a, a quote from scripture, uh, which, which was very nice. It, it was a very loving piece. And uh, I thought about her words and I, I created this piece, um, which is titled Beloved in honor of my friend. Beloved, yes, I mean, we are connected and this is like, you know, uh, uh, how we can stay connected, you know, because we've been through a lot in this couple of months, you know, all of us and uh, uh, we should know and um, we should do something for all of us to know like we are not alone, right? And we are all together. And this is how we grow closer to each other. I uh, think, oh, this is what we can do as artists, right? I think that is the role of an artist. And yes, exactly. The role of an artist is to, I feel, to hold up a mirror to our society and communicate what it is we're going through. Here, here is the peace the earth began to breathe. I mean, the fact that, that our environment is beginning to regenerate and recover um, is very important. So um, yes, that's our role. If we're, we're here to keep, to keep us all honest, if that makes any sense. Yes. Uh, to, to communicate what we're all feeling and to do it in a way that's candid and unique. We're all unique. We all create something that's very different. Um, and we will contribute to that human conversation. 
Yes, that's true. That's how we stay connected and feel close and feel we are not alone, right? And we can, um, especially now, which we have no access to others, to our family member, to our colleges, I don't know, whatever job we're doing. And we are kind of, um, we have to stay inside our, like, you know, our home, our houses. So this is the only way we can feel and we can feel each other and we can connect it, you know, be connected to each other and we can see each other, right? Through art, through maybe through different media. The one thing that occurs to me in all of this is that um, in, in my reading and even in the art making, and now particularly so, the, the human heart beats the same in every chest around the world. I'm convinced of it. Um, and the human heart has many sides. It can be very loving. It can be very dark. Uh, it can be compassionate and it can be cruel. But we are all the same. And I think the art becomes that language. It's a language we all can appreciate on some level um, okay. by sharing it and by people taking it in. I was always encouraged to ask, as I said in the beginning, the question why? And I think that's really important. Yeah. So uh, uh, one, one more thing, um, beside clutch, you do some painting as well, right? Yes, there's uh, always an underpainting to all of these collages. But there are some paintings where I, I try to mimic the collage. Okay, um, so um, so this is this is some of your painting uh, we see right now. That's um, are this painting also based on your reading? Yes, the draped in night was based on a series of uh, shorts by um, a gifted writer named Sarah Roth, and Sarah and I were um, residents together. We were fellows. Okay. And um, the overwhelming majority of people in that particular program were writers and poets. And, and Sarah is a clever wordsmith. Um, so Draped in Night um, refers to one of the pieces in, in that particular collection. Yes, and, and, and this one, Bones of an Inland Island, it actually is a take on a collection of short stories by another gifted writer named Mary Akers. Mary Akers published a collection of short stories uh, under the title, Bones of an Inland Sea. But there was something that I was thinking of when I, when I was reading that collection of short stories. And I was, I, again, it was, it was the environmental side of me. I was thinking about that encroachment and um, things changing. Um, and this painting resulted. They're, they're both that size. They almost bookend um, a series of 12 other um, paintings that aren't quite that large, that, that are collages. Um, and those were part of a challenge that my mentor, Fran, had given to me. Um, yeah. has, has your work changed over the time? Uh, are you, uh, like, did you do like, you know, collage and this abstract painting from beginning? Uh, al almost. I, I did some representational work but when I was very young, but I've always been drawn to the abstract expressionists. Mm -hmm. um, as a child, I actually ran into Louise Nevelson, who I thought was the most fascinating thing I'd ever seen. She was a wonderful, um, eccentric person. So I've always been drawn to that, that era and that genre. Um, I would, I would always go into museums that would feature a lot of Abex work and explore it, uh, even at a very young age. I, I didn't understand it. It challenged me. Um, and then I came to appreciate it, I suppose. I, I'm not quite sure that I completely understand the language, but I know that I, I can communicate uh, what I'm feeling, what we all feel inside. And that's what I think they were doing. Um, and they were, there was another abstract expressionist who's probably was not as well known at the time, Ethel Schwabecker, and I just love her work. Um, there are some, some artists, I think the artists that, that draw me in are those that make me think, that make me ponder. So people like Jenny Holzer, Tracy Eamon, uh, Cy Twombly, who, who's a master art maker, 
um, mark maker, those are the people who get me thinking. Philip Guston. Um, yeah, so those are the your favorite um, abstract artists. Another mentor of mine years ago would refer to artists that you are drawn to as being part of your tribe. And I understand that. So in some sense, I feel like they are. Yes, true. So that's the whole actually um, idea of um, all art as well as like abstract art, right? It keeps you thinking, what's the meaning of this art? So and people could have different opinion, you know? and different kind of interpretation for abstract art, right? What I see or what I feel could be different with what you had in your mind and you created this artwork. So that's the whole idea of um, abstract art kind of. I had an entire debate one time, Farron, with a um, <laughs> mentor about that. And he was saying that he would get insulted if people did not, um, realize what he was communicating in his work. He, he would be upset about it. And my response was, if I, as the artist, am the unique filter through which I'm processing the outside world, why isn't the viewer the unique filter through which they're taking in what I'm saying? Yeah, exactly. We all, re we all receive the communication differently. Yeah, exactly. So that's the whole idea of creating art. You know, it's not about you making, it's about how others see your work, right? And then how the understanding. So that's the whole idea about art, abstract, you know, any style or any different type of art, how people understand it. Um, do you have any, like, you know, um, good, you know, uh, some memorable responses to your work that you remember over the time? Yeah, one in particular, and it always comes to mind. I remember participating in a um, curated art event a long time, a long time ago, um, and I won a great prize. And I walked into the show. I didn't realize I had won. And I walked over to my piece. I was going around the gallery, and I noticed the award. And I see this couple standing in front of my painting, looking at it, and um, the woman. I was in back of them. The woman turned to the man and said, gee, our granddaughter could do a better job painting something like this. And they turned around and they noticed me. And I said, and, and they said their seven-year-old granddaughter. And, and I looked at them and I said, thank you. And <laughs> they, they, they kind of looked a little shocked. They said, I've been trying for years to get back to that innocent childlike state where I could paint like a child, where I could create and draw like a child. So you validated that I'm getting there. Yeah, I, I, that's that's that was the best response. I think, right? I you know it's just <laughs> it's truthful. Yeah, it is. It is. So, uh, what's your um, advice for our today guest? I think it's very important, regardless of what anybody does in their life and what their education is, is that we. Um, honor the arts, um, the visual and the performing arts. They are critical to developing fine minds, it, global problems uh, and solutions. We live in a, in a, in a global economy and um, a big world. We're all connected. Solutions will only come about through creative thinking. Um, the solutions have to be new and learning how to create those solutions will only come about from thinking creatively and thinking outside the box. Um, and the only way that happens is if people uh, honor the arts in their curriculums, in their education, if we expose our young ones to art of all kinds, get people to think it, it is invaluable to our future. That's true. Thank you very much, Pat. Um, this is the end of this week art conversation uh, with Pat. And uh, if you have any question and um, if you like to reach out to Pat, you can email her as email you see here on the screen. And um, if you have any questions, suggestion or comment for me and for us for NOVA, you can email us at office at um, the and please don't forget to 
add um, in subject line art conversation with Parin. Um, I'm, I look forward to see you all next Friday at 3 p.m. again with, uh, with our next talented artist. Um, stay safe and strong. I love you all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Farron. Goodbye. Bye.